good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, ACH Standards, Rules, and Laws. My name is Mike Wright, and I'm the Alliance Manager at Columbia Olson, and I'm happy to be your host today. Before we begin, I have a few items to go over. We'll be muting your phones for the call today to eliminate any background noise. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, please type it in the question box to submit to us. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible near the end of the presentation. In the occurrence that we are unable to address each question, a follow-up email will be sent with answers uh, to the question. Today's topic is designed to help answer questions around each of the new laws uh, and updated rules that have and are soon to be implemented by the National Automated Clearinghouse Association, or commonly referred to as NACHA. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Marsha Jones is the president of the Third Party Payment Processors Association, a membership association providing leadership, advocacy, and compliance support to third party payment processors and financial institutions. Marsha is an accredited ACH professional, a national check professional, and has over 20 years experience in the financial services industry. Before joining the TP PPA, Marsha was product manager for Viewpoint a regional payments association and served as a member of the risk management and advisory group of the NACHA. She previously worked for Capital Bank Corp Limited, where she managed all payment processing for more than 50 community banks. Prior to Capital Bank Corp, Marsha managed small business lending renewal operations for Wells Fargo Bank. Melanie Bieber holds a master's degree in business administration from Ohio Dominican Re University and is the compliance officer at EFT Network and an accredited ACH professional. She's been working in the industry for eight years. As a certified ACH professional, she is recognized for her electronic payments expertise and is responsible for being up to date on NACHA laws, rules, and regulations, and stays ahead of the coming changes to the rules. She also educates organizations on the importance of compliance in relation to NACHA, providing them with the necessary information to understand these rules for essential for meeting their needs. And finally, as Director of Product Engineering, Dan Womack is accountable for the development and delivery of quality, benefit-focused products at Columbia Ultimate. For the past 13 years, he has focused on helping organizations increase contact rates while decreasing costs and ensuring compliance. During his career, Dan has helped hundreds of agencies and municipalities in implementing successful contact management strategies. Thank you for all for, for joining us today. I'd like to hand the presentation over to Marsha and Melanie. Thank you. Um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, it's important to understand that the material that we provide um, to you today, even though we're going to be talking about laws and rules and regulations, is not considered legal advice. And if you need any legal advice on this, you should um, seek um, counsel from your attorney. We can move on to the next slide. Today we're going to talk about um, several different things. We're going to um, talk about NACHA and um, the role that NACHA plays in the payments industry. Um, we'll talk about some of the um, standard entry class codes or SEC codes, which are the product types um, available in the ACH network. And then we're going to talk about some rule changes, some that went into effect in September that um, likely impact you already, and then some that are coming up um, in the near future. Then we're going to be talking about um, the Federal Trade Commission's ruling on um, remotely created checks. Um, there was a recent amendment to the telemarketing sales rule that banned um, various payment types, including remotely created checks, and we'll discuss that a little bit further. You can go to the next slide, please. And I want to talk to you about um, NACHA and who NACHA is. Um, NACHA is the National Automated Clearinghouse Association. Um, and um, they are not a government agency. NACHA is a private network um, that is run by its members who are either direct voting members, which are financial institutions, or regional payments associations that have um, financial institutions and others um, as members. 
and uh, they NACHA also has non-voting members that are affiliate members or members of the Payments Innovation Alliance. So if you're not a financial institution but want to be engaged in the rulemaking process um, and have the opportunity to work uh, directly with NACHA and its members, either being an affiliate member or participating on the Payments Innovation Alliance is the best way to do that. Now the, um, the ACH network um, is designed to comply with federal um, regulations, um, primarily um, Regulation E. And the um, not just serves as the governing body of um, the ACH network. They, their responsibilities include risk management, um, you know, creating rules, the rule framework for the network, um, and moving the forward. And what we'll see in the, the recent rule changes that uh, most of them are related to risk management. And uh, most of the risk management emphasis right now is related to the role of originators and um, their financial institutions. Um, we will talk a little bit about um, same day ACH, which um, is a departure from the um, risk management aspect of the network where uh, Notch is looking to move the network forward um, in, in an innovative way and allow um, further innovation within the network. The thing that, that's important to understand about the ACH network, even though it's not a government um, body, um, it does connect nearly 12,000 financial institutions. So the fact that there are so many uh, financial institutions, virtually all of them, uh, participate in the ACH network, makes it um, you know, a ubiqui ubiquitous network where if you are presenting your payments, you can get to just about any financial institution within the country. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is a breakdown of some of the most popular SEC codes or products that are offered through NACHA. We're going to talk more in depth on the first two, TEL and WEB, which are telephone and web or online payments. The third is a PPD or a pre-authorized debit or credit payment. In this case, you would be required to have a signed contract. POS is point of sale. Those are primarily um, card transactions, CIE are consumer initiated credit, and then obviously you have um, the three different types of scan checks mechanisms along with corporate debits and then international or IAT transactions. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. The next um, main point is tel or telephone transactions. These are going to be consumer-initiated um, debits um, from to a consumer's account. These would be payments that are um, fully over the phone between you and your customer and a business. Um, the authorizations um, must obviously include several different scenarios, including the date of the phone call the dates of the debits, the amounts, and then you must, requ it's required to offer a method for the client or consumer to revoke the authorization. With telephone payments, um, we currently in the NACHA industry are offering single as well as reoccurring payments. For the single payment, you are required to either record your phone call or send a written notice. With reoccurring payments, biggest difference is you have to record the phone call and send a written notice before the debit is taken place. Do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? Okay. This graph shows a breakdown of the information that is generally required um, by NACHA and is more of the industry average of what other banks are looking for. Obviously, if you're recording the phone call for a single or reoccurring, you're required to state the date of the call, the consumer's full name. The banks also want to hear them actually say, I authorize 
your company or I authorize ABC company to debit my account. They're obviously looking for pertinent banking information that would include routing an account number, payment dates, amounts, and obviously the method to revoke the authorization. They are also looking for, in the method to revoke, typically the company's contact information. The majority of the companies that we deal with will say, if you need to cancel or revoke your payment, please call us at and provide their information. The majority of this information is also required on any written statement or written notice that is provided to the customer before your reoccurring debit or even your single debit if you choose to not record your phone calls. The difference with the written payment or written notice is if it is a reoccurring transaction, you have to provide them a payment schedule. So if you have five payments listed, you need to tell them when they will expect all five payments, not just the current payment that is due. You want to go ahead and go to the next slide, please? The second um, type of authorization we're going to discuss is web or internet initiated slash mobile entries. These would be anything that is initiated by a consumer by going online to your website and submitting a payment. This can be a single or reoccurring payment. The websites must clearly indicate that it's going to be an ACH payment and obviously provide a lot of the same information that's required for the tells, obviously the date, the amounts, and they must also provide a method to revoke the authorization. When you're providing your processor, if you ever have a disputed item or you ever have to provide a copy of an authorization, the industry is really looking for um, obviously pertinent banking information the date, the exact time the payment was made, the amounts, and then any unique information that would be entered. Um, if they have to create a username and password, if you can provide the username, a lot of people don't want to provide passwords, which is reasonable. Um, any personal information they had to provide, last four digits of the social, birthday, mother's maiden name. They're also looking to try to make it a more of an industry standard of obtaining the IP address or somehow geosyncing their actual location as part of their web authorization. The IP address is one of the strongest pieces of information you can provide when you are doing a web authorization. This shows the exact place that the payment was made from. The web and tell are the two largest um, authorizations that we typically see from a collection industry on the back end is where their system will automatically determine whether it should be hotel or web. But you do need to make sure that you are following the correct authorization requirements depending on how you're accepting it, whether it's online or over the phone. You want to go ahead and go to the next slide, please? Next, I'm going to talk about some of the recent rule changes that have went into, a, into effect in last September, and then Marsha will also be talking about a few of the upcoming rule changes that she briefly um, touched on earlier. The first rule change is for reinitiated entries. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, please. A reinitiated entry would be a resubmission of an, of an item that was previously returned for NSF or uncollected funds. This also can be an item that was returned as ROA or stop payment after you've obtained a new authorization from the customer. A reinitiated item, not just requiring the company name, the company ID, and the amount to be the same. If you have a returned item and you choose to charge a fee, the fee must be sent separately. You cannot add a $15 fee to a $100 returned item. They have to be sent separately. Reinitiated um, items follow a lot of the same rules as a return check. It has to be resubmitted within 180 days of the original return. 
and you're only permitted three attempts, including the original. If you submitted it for a fourth attempt in that situation, you could be sub, um, you could be, you could have a rules violation filed against you by a receiving bank. The one thing to keep in mind with reinitiated items is the company entry description field is slightly different than a normal payment. Nacho is requiring it to say retry payment instead of, for a normal item it could say a gas bill or collection attempt. Um, with the retry payment, they're requiring this entry description for they can, for other banks can easily identify when an item was previously returned to monitor that the companies are following the correct um, collection and reattempt um, attempts. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay. The next rule that went into effect in September was an update to the unauthorized return rate threshold. The current rate, um, it, well, now is one is a half a percent. Before um, September, it was currently at one percent. So they did decrease the overall um, the overall unauthorized return rate that you are permitted to have as an originator. These would include any returns that are unauthorized for an RO5, RO7, R10, R29, or R51. The percentage is determined by taking the total number of unauthorized returns for those return um, codes and dividing it by the total number of items you've originated over a 60-day period. As I said, this is currently this has been a rule set um, for a while. They've just reduced the overall um, number of returns, unauthorized returns you can have. So this rule will continue to use the current enforcement process as it has in the past. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, please. The next two rules are new rules that have been put into place that also monitor your return rate levels. The first one is an administrative return rate. NACHA has established the administrative return rate at 3%. This would include any returns for RO2, RO3, or RO4, so account closed, unable to locate account, or invalid routing number. NACHA has currently set it at 3%, which is about nine times higher than the national average. Obviously, Depending on the industry, what you would consider an average will differ. Collection industry, you're going to have a little bit of a higher average return rate than what would be considered the national average, which would also include utilities, grocery stores types of payments. This percentage is also, um, they're determining your percentage the same way as the unauthorized by taking your total number of administrative returns and dividing it by your number of originated items over a 60-day time frame. One of the new aspects in this rule is instead of an immediate enforcement process, NACHA is opening this rule to an inquiry process. So with this and the next rule that we're going to discuss is you will have the option if you are over the 3% return rate to present your case saying why we are currently over it, what we're doing to reduce it, or why we feel that our industry, this industry standard, will be higher than what you've set it. So you do have an inquiry process. Um, it's not an immediate rules violation. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Melanie, real quick question. Mm -hmm. um, as, as clients are approaching that number, are they able to get any notification of that or are they made aware of that from EFT generally? If, if you do go through EFT network, um, we do review um, return rates on a 30-day period. So unlike NACHO, we review them 30 days. And then if you are close or going over that, we will notify you, letting you know, hey, you are very close. Um, 
we currently have not had any inquiries from actual NACHA with EFT clients. Um, they also have told us they haven't defined what a low-level originator is to NACHA, but if you only process 20 items a month and you have a return, obviously you're going to be over your admin or even in this case your overall return rate. They are not going to come after the lower level originators, especially in the beginning. These roles are really set to go after the large, huge processors um, that are, or people who are completely have no, they're, it's just complete disregard for the roles. So if you are a lower volume originator, we will notify you, hey, you're getting close to this or we are concerned but most likely this will be more, this will affect more of the larger volume originators. Perfect, thank you. The next role um, that has to do, it has the same process as the administrative one. It is also a new role that went into effect in September is your overall return rate. This is for any return regardless of what the return code is with the and regardless of the SEC code with the exception of RCK entries. NACHA has once again set this, oh, sorry, they've set this role at 15%, which is once again higher than the national average. Currently, they're stating the national average is about 1.4 return percent. So obviously, they're, they are aware that they cannot limit people right out of, right from the start. Um, they may, down the line, review these return rates and decrease or increase them depending on where the national average influx is to. This return rate is the same as the other two. You'll take your total number of returns, dividing it by your number of originated items. This return rate is also subject to the inquiry process as the administrative one is. And then if NACHA does deem that there are blatant disregards for the return rates or bad business practices in general, then they could enforce in an enforcement process. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, this slide briefly talks about what the difference between a return threshold and a return level is. The easiest way to tell the difference is a threshold is a hard limit. This has to deal with the unauthorized return rate. With a threshold, if you do go above it, you are subject to a possible immediate reaction or immediate actions from NACHA to decrease your return rates. In this case, you could be subject to fines or possible termination if NACHA felt that your actions were that severe. A return level has to deal with the administrative and the overall return rate. As I said before, NACHA, if you do exceed these limits, NACHA will contact your ODFI or your bank or processor and request them to provide additional documentation as to why you've exceeded it, what is your plan to reduce your return rates over the next 30 days, and how you plan to keep those return rates under the set limit. After NACHA reviews the information that you've provided, if then they feel that there's still a warrant for immediate action or possibility of fines or possible termination, then they would enforce those. Um, this information is reviewed by a panel, so it's not one person at NACHA who decides who's going to have an enforcement action against them and who's not. It is reviewed by a panel. Um, I think there's, there's different types of banking. Um, banks are representative, and I'm I think there's also members from the regional payment associations that are also represented on this panel. That's correct, Melanie. 
you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is a really, a lot of information that basically says the exact same thing that we just, I just, it shows the difference between the unauthorized threshold enforcement and then the inquiry slash enforcement process with the admin or overall. Um, the fourth and fifth steps down, obviously, in the enforcement, um, the unauthorized, they're not available. It, it's an immediate reaction or actions required from NACHA versus the inquiry process where you are allowed to fight your case. Um, we're in a collection industry. There's a higher overall return percentage. Those types of things that would be where you would um, provide additional information to NACHA. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, Marcia is going to take over um, to discuss some of the upcoming rule changes that are going into effect. Thank you. So the first um, change that we're going to talk about um, happens in September of this year, and that's when the first phase of same-day ACH um, funding comes into play. And um, you know, really what this means is that um, settlement will occur for files that are transmitted today versus um, you know, settlement occurring for files transmitted the, um, today for the following day. Um, there are some limitations to this that, um, regardless of the phase, um, remain in effect. Um, and that is that it is limited to entries under $25,000, and um, there will be no international um, ACH um, entries eligible for same-day process. Um, not just uh, has implementation happen happening in three different phases. In the first phase, what will happen is there will be two additional submission deadlines provided. So files that are submitted to the ACH operator by 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time will settle at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So um, if you are um, you know, looking to get into that settlement window, you would need to work with your, um, your payment processor and or bank to determine what time they would need the file in order to be able to uh, process it and send it to the ACH operator. So um, you, know, you need to consider the fact that these time frames are related to when the bank provides um, you know, the, the file to the ACH operator, not when you provide it to the bank or you provide it to your payment processor. The other window is um, a 3 p.m. Eastern time window, um, and any files that are provided um, in time to make that window will settle um, at 5 p.m. When it talks about settling, it means that the bank um, will receive funds um, for the entries at 5 p.m. Um, or 1 p.m. if they make the earlier window. Um, in phase one, only credits will be um, eligible to be processed. Um, and um, from the standpoint of funds availability, the funds will be available at the end of the RDFI's processing day um, in phase one and also phase two. So that means if the RDFI completes their processing at midnight, then those funds would be available at midnight. Um, when we move on to phase two, we do have the opportunity to process um, debits as well. Um, but again, it's um, still under $25,000 and no international um, transactions. Phase three um, will actually have all of the same things, credits and debits, the two processing windows. But the thing that changes in phase three is that the RDFI will need to make the funds available um, by 5 p.m. RDFI local time. So you know, that gives you an idea of what we can expect over the next couple of years here related to same-day ACH. So let's move on to the next. Oh, um, there, one other thing about um, same-day ACH, there is a fee that applies. And so if, if entries are going to be processed same day, it's going to be based on the, um, the date that is um, in the entry. And if that entry is for today, um, then it will be processed you know, in the next available window. 
Um, and there will be a, a 5.2 cent per entry fee that will happen. So what's going to be important is that if you um, have stale dated or um, early dated um, files and you're, um, and you're not intending it to be same day, you need to make sure that you adjust the dates um, in your file. Otherwise, it will be processed same day and uh, there will be a 5.2 cent fee added to any entries that are processed. So we can um, now go on to the next slide. The next um, rule change that um, goes into effect is related to um, some of the um, rules that Melanie was talking about previously, particularly the unauthorized returns. Um, in October of this year, um, NACHA will be um, assessing a fee of $4.50 for any unauthorized returned entry. So that means that, um, and NACHA doesn't retain any part of this fee, but for any um, entry that's returned, R05, um, 7, 10, 29, or 51, which is essentially um, unauthorized or authorization revoked, that fee will be passed on to the ODFI and very likely the ODFI will then um, you know, uh, send the fee down to the payment processor and the payment processor would, um, would push the fee down to the merchant. So that's one of the things that you're going to need to be uh, prepared for and we all understand that a lot of times unauthorized um, entries were truly authorized. There's no way to recoup that fee through the network. There's no way to stop that fee. Um, there will have to be some way of recouping that fee outside of the network. So let's go on to the, the next slide, please. The next thing I want to talk about um, is outside of um, the ACH rules, but it does um, likely impact um, this audience, and that's the um, amendments to the telemarketing sales rule. The telemarketing sales rule was um, enacted in 1994, and it's been amended um, several times um, you know, related to activities that happen um, in, uh, over the telephone. Um, where, where money is exchanged. And so it's important to make sure that you understand the telemarketing sales rule. The FTC or Federal Trade Commission is the owner of the rule, but um, there can be some state actions that are taken on the telemarketing sales rule, and we've actually even seen the CFPB utilizing the telemarketing sales rule. So you want to make sure that you understand um, the requirements. It applies to virtually all telemarketing that's defined uh, to mean a plan, a program, a, a program campaign, um, which is conducted to induce the purchase of goods or services or a charitable contribution over the phone. So it, you know, it really is um, you know, not just selling things um, over the, the phone, but also um, you know, getting paid for services um, where that transaction is conducted over the phone. Um, from the standpoint of this audience, it probably doesn't directly apply um, if you're, uh, you're processing a collection call, but if that collection call does turn into some kind of a sales call for new services, um, you know, restoring services or whatever, it could fall into the realm of the telemarketing sales rule. So it's very important to you know, make sure that you understand that you know, there are some requirements that may um, impact you. So let's go on to the next slide. Now the recent amendment to the telemarketing sales rule um, you know, had a few things, but the primary thing that we're going to talk about here is payments that have been banned. Um, because they've been deemed as abusive and there has been you know, a significant amount of fraud that has um, happened related um, to these forms of payments. Um, so um, the FTC is banning any um, uh, payment that falls under the telemarketing sales rule um, uh, not to be used with remotely created checks or remotely created um, payment orders 
cash to cash money transfers or cash reloadable uh, mechanisms. So um, let's go on to the next slide and talk about uh, what those mean in more detail. Thank you. All right, so first, um, remotely created checks um, and remotely created payment orders. Um, it's important to understand that what this is is a payment order that um, is not signed um, and is um, processed through the check um, clearing system. So if, if you are, um, you know, you have a practice where you're utilizing some method other than the ACH um, system to be able to process a payment and you create a check and then uh, with no signature on it and then you know process it or you bypass the um, creating the physical check and create an image of a check either way those payments are banned um, in any transaction where the telemarketing sales rule is in effect so um, I think that you have a specific name for one of your products. Is that correct, Dan, that, that utilizes this? Many, many clients have called this QRemit, or uh, this is essentially taking checking information over the phone and then uh, printing the check in-house and then walking that over to the bank. That check isn't signed by the consumer. And so if you're taking checks into the bank where that aren't signed by the consumer, that's these remotely created checks. Many clients are calling that QRemit. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, you know, you need to think about your, your payment mechanisms and if there's been any transaction that has occurred, um, you know, over the phone, you know, for the sale of goods or services, um, then you want to make sure that you're not using um, this, um, that particular uh, payment device. So let's uh, move on to the next one, which are probably less likely, but um, cash to cash money transfers, um, meaning you know if someone um, goes to um, take cash into a transfer agent um, so that they can turn that cash into you know some form of electronic payment um, that is then you know converted cash on the other end um, cannot be used in a payment for um, goods or services that is that falls under the telemarketing sales rule. This is another um, payment mechanism that has been um, tied to fraud, um, and so it is banned, you know, in the context of telemarketing um, sales rule. The next um, slide talks about cash reload mechanisms. And a cash reload mechanism is when there's a, a process, and these don't really exist much anymore, but it's a process where you provide the, or you know, the consumer provides the ability for a person to convert cash into um, something that can be um, reloaded on a prepaid card. Now, this does not mean that the general use prepaid card, a debit card, um, you know, cannot be used in these cases. But if there's this cash reload mechanism attached to that, then um, it does not, um, it can, it's um, not allowed for anything that falls under the telemarketing sales rule. And, um, you know, that's likely not something that you're going to see either. So let's go on to the next slide. The thing that's concerning about, um, you know, and, you know, the probable in, um, implications of these amendments to the telemarketing sales rule is that it um, defines these payment types as abusive. And so, you know, that creates greater scrutiny. Um, it also, um, abusive is one of the key uh, distinctions in UDAP and um, what is likely to happen since the FTC in this ruling has um, deemed these payments as abusive. It um, opens up the opportunity for this to morph into a UDAP violation. 
which um, UDAP is generally um, administered by the CFPB. So it could mean that the CFPB would look at these payment types as abusive and may even um, go beyond the telemarketing sales rule. So we need to be watching very closely what happens with this because it is likely to have some um, you know, further downstream consequences. It's also likely to be used um, by the FTC and the CFPB in enforcement proceedings more broadly than those that are banned by the telemarketing sales. Um, then again, that's because of this abusive standard. It's also likely to cause other regulators to frown upon the, the banned payments more broadly than the telemarketing sales rule. So you may see even further um, you know, decline in the opportunities to utilize remotely created checks um, because of the increased, increased scrutiny and um, you know, risk um, related to processing these types of payments. So it's something that we do want to, to keep a close eye on. And um, from the standpoint of the Third Party Payment Processors Association, you know, we believe that it, you know, uh, this payment mechanism should be allowed for anyone that's processing a legal transaction. And so what we're going to be doing is creating some best practices for remotely created checks for banks and payment processors to help um, you know, push back a little bit on some of these uh, potential consequences that we'll see in the future. And I believe that is the end of the, the content. So we'd like to ask everyone at this time, if they have questions that like to, they'd like to get answered, uh, type them in the question box. And as those questions come in, I will um, I'll, I'll dole them out to the presenters. In the meantime, while those questions come in, Dan, did you have some clarifying comments to make? I had some audio problems in the beginning of the presentation, so I apologize. I'm going to go back a couple slides. Um, we're going to go back, actually, to the different types of, of SEC codes. This is a very popular question that comes from clients. Um, we, I hear this several times, probably even a, a month or a week, of the different types of codes that, that we offer. And inside of our software, inside the Clinton Ultimate Software Package, we, we are managing what type of code we're transacting over to the networks. And, and if there's a questionnaire that is being answered by the agents as they're putting the payments in that would help determine if it's a tell transaction or if the consumer is making a payment through the web, if it's a web transaction, or if you're getting a actual paper contract back from the consumer, uh, whether they walked in or whether you mailed it to them, they mailed back to you a paper contract with their signature, that would be a PPD. Um, so th these different types of codes are very important. They have different requirements. Um, you heard a little bit about that. The, the next couple of slides talked about that. Um, so it's important to know what type of transactions you are doing, which ones you're interested in, and what those requirements are. Fairly recently, it's been a few years, I guess, um, there's been an extension to the NACHA rulebook to allow for a recurring TEL transaction. Um, so maybe Marsha or Melanie, would you take a minute maybe to talk about that option about recurring TEL? Many of our client base probably aren't aware of that or aren't using that today. They're using PPD transactions. So um, recurring TEL is a very neat option that, that we'd like to make them aware of. If, if you can take a minute to talk about that. Sure. The biggest difference, um, instead of having to mail, mail your client a contract and wait for them to return it, you're taking the chance of them not returning it or not returning it within an agreed upon time frame. You do have the option now of doing a reoccurring tell. are required to record the phone call and retain it for two years as a part of the authorization as well as send a notification detailing the scheduled payment as well as future payments that are part of that schedule. To them, um, we suggest 10 day, at least 10 days before the payment is scheduled. Um, this way, you're not waiting for the client or taking the chance that the client will not return your paperwork um, to process it as a PPD. The biggest thing is to remember you have to send the notices. It is one of Notch's requirements, um, and you do have to be able to retain or reproduce a copy of all the notices that would have been sent for up to two years after the final payment is submitted. 
And that's also true of a call recording, is that correct? Yes. If you, re if you do a reoccurring um, or if you even do a single, it's, you have to retain the information from, from the last payment. So if you have a payment schedule that starts January 1st, of 2016 and goes until January 1st, 2017, you have to keep it from two years after the payment in 2017. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience we can, we can uh, address? Looks like there are a few questions that are coming in regarding um, logistics of the presentation. Uh, we'll be sending out copies of the slides to those who uh, ask for it. We'll also be posting some video covering this material in the next few weeks and we'll follow up with answers to the questions for each attendee by the end of the week. I think we got some more questions coming in. So one of the questions is to clarify we cannot use the recurring tell option unless the call is recorded. Correct. You have to to record the phone call and send the notice. And keep those for two years after the last payment on that plan. Correct. And then another question that coming is, in is? That is one of the downsides. Um, a lot of customers that we do see who choose not to do the tell that they do choose to keep doing the PPD is because of the capabilities of re retaining the phone call for that time frame. So that is something that your customers need to be aware if they do decide to switch over to telephone. Right. So the distinction really between the PPD and the recurring tell, the PPD is a written contract that you're sending out and getting a return signature back from the consumer to be able to process those payments at that schedule on those dates. The recurring tell is the agreement being done over the telephone to do those, uh, but that has the requirement of having a call recording that's retained and kept for that period of time. And then you were required to send the notice out to the consumer, um, not necessarily required to get it back. One of the, one of the questions here is, is, do we need to send a notice to the initial tell or one for each of the payments as they're being processed? You have to send a reminder notar notice 10 days before each payment. So the initial payment, you could go ahead and process. If they called in today, you could process it today to hit tomorrow morning and then if they set it up for a monthly schedule, you would have to send May's payment reminder 10 days before the payment was due on May 27th. And just as a reminder for those working with the Columbia Ultimate Software, we help you through this process. So as you're going through underwriting with us, we help you uh, gather these requirements, make sure that you're doing them, uh, help you through them. We have some templates, we have some scripts that you can use um, so that we can help you help you get there if you're not there today. Okay, there's several questions about the slide deck. Uh, any of those interested in the slide deck, let us know. Uh, we'll have that distributed out after the completion of the webinar. It looks like the questions have uh, stopped. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. and Thank you, Marsha, Melanie, and Dan for a great presentation. Um, and that concludes our webinar. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.